Hello there. I'm Ron Bailey from BibleBase.com, welcoming you to our Home and Away section of Bible Based Podcasts, available wherever you listen to your podcasts. These recordings are of messages preached in my home church or as a visiting preacher in other places. They are here simply because I judge that they might be appreciated by others in other places. So, as the sounds of Charles Wesley's wonderful hymn, Arise My Soul, Arise, to the tune Millennium Fades Away, please listen with heart and soul and mind poised to be not only hearers, but doers of the word. May the Lord bless you. If you have any comments, we would be glad to hear them. There will be details of place and time at the end of the message. Good morning, saints. Can you hear me? Good, thank you. I I had muted myself here. I'm sorry about that. (laughs) It's um, lovely to see everybody. Um, And even if maybe I'm singing occasionally a little bit out of sync, that's um that's okay isn't it? it it's wonderful to be here it really is lovely to see everybody i, I was at aurora last week so um, zooming around the country has taken on a new meaning for me and i was saying things at aurora that are still kind of resonating with me this week so i want to kind of follow part of the same kind of uh line although it probably won't go in quite the same direction i want to talk about one of the titles of Jesus that it's, I think, easy to forget. It's this title. It's used in the book of the Revelation. In fact, in all the wonderful things it says about Christ in the book of Revelation, one of the first things it says is it describes him as the faithful witness. Jesus is a faithful witness. Being faithful is one of the unique attributes of God. It's easy for us to forget this now, but for most religions in the world, their gods are not faithful. Their gods are capricious. You're never quite sure what they're going to do. They may steal your wife. They may do all kinds of things to you. You never know where you are with them. But with the God who revealed himself to the Hebrew people and in Jesus Christ, we have a God who is utterly faithful, who never does anything capriciously, who is always consistent with all of his character. Can you hear me all right? Okay, all right. Um, just just get a signal um, if you can't if you can't hear me. So so God is utterly faithful, and this is one of the things that comes through in the book of Revelation, where the promises are given to the saints who are faithful in their witness of Him. But Jesus Christ, as the faithful witness, I want to read a couple of passages of Scripture, which one of them speaks of Him as the faithful witness, and another one which actually illustrates his faithfulness in in witness i also had a request for him but you didn't have the words for it so I've, i've declined the possibility of singing it on my own but if you've got the hymn book at home i'll just tell you one of the the words it's a hymn called um the secret of his presence and it has an interesting story it was written by a woman whose name is ellen lakshmi gura and for those folks from um and uh, Nepal, who are with us this morning, or from India, uh, you probably noticed that word Lakshmi in the middle of there. And you thought, well, what's that name doing? And that's one, I think Lakshmi is the Hindu goddess of luck, isn't she? Or something like that. How does this happen? Well, Lakshmi, Gora Lakshmi, um, uh, was, uh, uh, sorry, Ellen Gora Lakshmi, was the daughter of a man who had been uh, a high caste Brahmin, that's the highest priestly caste of Hinduism. Um, and he lived in um, Benares, uh, Varanasi, as they call it now, which is just about the most holy city in India. And he came to Christ and he became a, a, a Christian minister. He became a, a preacher and he had a, a daughter whose name they called Ellen Lakshmi Gura. And she um, didn't know her father at all because, in fact, he died the same year that she was born. And then she was adopted into another family. And then she came to England to kind of do some, ha- have some education. 
and then finally she went back. But she had this gift of writing hymns, and Francis Ridley Havergal encouraged her to write hymns. And she wrote this hymn, which says, um, In the secret of his presence, how my soul delights to hide. Oh, how precious are the lessons which I learn at Jesus' side. But I wanted to read it, or sing it, um, for this particular verse. It says this, um, Only this I know. I tell him all my doubts and griefs and fears. Oh, how patiently he listens, and my drooping soul he cheers. Do you think he ne'er reproves me? What a false friend he would be if he never, never told me of the sins which he must see. Our Jesus is not a partial witness. He is a faithful witness. And I want to talk to you about his willingness to risk you being offended by the things that he may say to you in his determination to be a faithful witness. That is a, a verse, maybe you know it in the Proverbs, which says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. That's a very profound statement. Uh, what would you rather have? Someone who told you lies and said all kind of nice things about you, but actually was setting you up for a fall? Or would you rather have a friend who was faithful to you and when he saw something that was inconsistent with the way of your profession, actually came to you and spoke to you. Well, Jesus is a faithful witness. Let me read to you from Isaiah chapter 50. If you've got your Bible, please turn with it, because I want to go through some of these verses. <clears throat> this is a, a section of Isaiah where, in, in a sense, the Messiah Christ himself begins to come into clearer and clearer focus. It's a... They sometimes call Isaiah the evangelical prophet, and it's partly because of these sections that you have. This is Isaiah then chapter 55, and it says this. It starts off with the word ho. How do you pronounce ho? How do you say ho? I guess it depends what mood you're in when you say ho. You say oh, oh, oh. You see, just depending on what you're thinking depends on how you say the word Ho, oh, there's a story here. About the same time that uh, John, that Charles Wesley was writing that hymn we just sang, there was another famous preacher whose name was George Whitfield, and um, he a very powerful servant of God, and uh, he was able, uh, with his voice, uh, to reach thousands at the same time. And my powerful things happened. People were just broken under the sense of God's presence and came to genuine faith. And there was a famous person living at the same time who was an actor. His name was David Garrick, and there's still a, a Garrick Theatre in London. Um, and uh, on one occasion, someone tried to persuade David Garrick to go along to one of George Whitfield's meetings to listen to it. So in the end, he went, and then these two people met up later, and the friend said to Garrick, so what did you think about George Whitfield? And Garrick said this, he said, I know this. He said, I would give a hundred guineas to be able to say, oh, like that man. So what did he hear in the voice of George Whitfield? He heard the heart of God. He heard this ache that is in the heart of God. And here it comes through in Isaiah chapter 55. Oh, God is longing, longing, longing. And what is it that is this longing that brings this groan? It isn't actually a word in the Old Testament or the, Old, the New Testament. It isn't a word. It's just a single letter O. So it's, it's, it's a groan or a cry or whatever. Ho. Oh. Oh, says God. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You'll notice the repetition of the word come here. You'll get it four times in these next few verses. Ho, 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 everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you have who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy. And then God tells us what we should do. And you'll see there is a, a little series 
of imperatives here. Those are little instructions that God gives to us. Here's the first one. Listen carefully to me. So it isn't just that you come for a pat on the head or a kiss on the cheek. You come to listen to him. This is what coming to Christ means. It doesn't just mean that you're kind of turning from your sins. It means you're turning to him and you're bringing your life under his authority. You're actually saying from this moment on, I will not live my life according to my own standards, my own judgments, but I come to listen to what you have to say. What do you have to say? You probably heard me tell this little story before as well. And um, I've had a few journeys to uh, Poland, not as many as Dave Medlock, but a few of them. And um, I noticed that when I was in someone's home and the telephone rang, they would lift up the receiver and they would say, sue him. And after a while, I became intrigued with this word suham, because it doesn't sound like hello or a greeting. And I said to someone, what does it mean, this word suham? Valdemar, who was one of the brothers there, he said, oh, he said, it just says, I'm listening. And suham has become one of my arrow prayers. Uh, when I'm reading the scriptures, sometimes even before I pray, sometimes before I preach, I will just say, Lord, suham, I'm listening, I'm listening. So here, it's not just that you come and you drink, but you come and you drink and you listen. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. And then on the same theme, he says, incline your ear, you know, turn your ear to me. Listen, shut out all the other noises, all the other things that are happening. And here again, fourth time in these few verses, come to me. Hear, hearken, and your soul shall live. What it's really saying is that you, when God begins to speak into our lives, what we need to do is we need to engage with what God is saying. We need to respond to him. The people who, in, who understand computers will sometimes talk about handshaking. It means that you don't try to send information until the person at the other end has said, I'm listening to you. I was a Boy Scout and I learned semaphore. And I've forgotten what the letters were now, but when you start to semaphore using flags, you send two letters and so you keep on sending these two letters until the person you can see in the distance sends you a letter which says, OK, I've got you. I'm listening to you. And God needs to get our attention. And he says, come. And then he says, now, listen, listen. He says this, listen here and your soul shall live and I will make this is God declaring his will now. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people. Now, I, Isaiah is living ooh, uh, kind of, what, 300 years after David. So why is he saying here that God is going to give sure mercies, that covenant promise to David, and that he's given him as a witness. Now, I know that David wrote Psalms and that he was a prophet in his own right, but that isn't what he's referring to. You see, when it says David here, it means David's greatest son. It means Jesus. This is the son of David it's referring to. So you've got a promise here, a clear promise in the book of the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 55, that God says, if you do this, if you respond to me, if you hear what I'm saying to you, if you accept the invitation, if you come to me, if you listen to what I'm saying to you, we're really back in the territory that Paul was in a couple of weeks ago, aren't we? When we really just need to soak in what God is saying and respond to it, and we will grow. We will grow. We will become what God intends us to be. So he says here, indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people. There's that word witness again. This is significant because the Jewish people were destined to be, if I've not said this before and you've not heard me say this before, you just wait for this for a moment. The Jewish people under the covenant with Moses were destined to be the authentic Jehovah's Witnesses. Not, not the people who come knocking at your door. Those are fake Jehovah's Witnesses. But the real Jehovah's Witnesses were intended to be the people of Israel. You are my witnesses, says Jehovah. That's also in the book of Isaiah. So they failed in their witness. They did, they did not 
They did not do the job that they were given to do. And instead of being to the praise and glory of God, sadly, the scripture says they actually, the, the Gentiles actually blasphemed the name of God because of the behavior of the people who were intended to be his witnesses. But here prom God promises a witness and he, the sure mercies of David, a witness to the people, a leader and a commander. This is an amazing passage. I haven't got time to read all of it. But if you go on, you'll see that it, it tells you other things that you must do. You must seek um, and all call upon him. And he will respond to you. In other words, when God speaks to us, we need to engage with him. This is what Billy Graham, the old days, would have said, doing business with God. Um, you transact with God. You're not just listening to him. You're not just saying, yes, I love his voice. I'd give a hundred guineas if I could speak like that. But you're engaging with God. This is, this is what faith does. It engages with the thing that God is saying. God spoke to people at other times and it wasn't. It didn't profit them, it says in Hebrews, because it wasn't mixed with faith. So if the things that God says to you are going to be a profit to you, you must engage with them. Are you with me? So here he is. He is the faithful witness. I'm not going to go through all this, but it goes on to say some wonderful things. I'll bring it just a little bit more to you. This bit from verse eight. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, says Jehovah, nor are my ways your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And here's the link with Hebrews that Paul was on a couple of weeks ago. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, it shall accomplish what I please. It shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it, if we receive it. Exceeding great and precious promises, whereby we may become partakers of a divine nature. But not just because we've seen them on the page of a book. Only when we embrace them, only when we trust God to be faithful to his word. It goes on. I won't go on. Not on this passage anyway. That's enough to say that. Did you notice that little phrase? that you had there when it says um um where is it come to me it says in the in chapter 55 and verse 3 incline your ear and come to me if i had started this little chat this morning at another place and i had said to you i'm going to give you three words and i want you to finish off the sentence if i had said to you come unto me I wonder how you would have finished it off. I think probably most of us would have said, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. As Jesus takes up these same words, this same invitation in Matthew chapter 11. Let's turn there, shall we? Matthew chapter 11. Um, I'll read from verse 25, and this will give us part of the link of what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> verse 25 of Matthew 11 says this, At that time, I wonder if you've noticed how often the Bible gives you time stamps. How often it will say what the context was. Because the words of God, as we find them in the scriptures, really can only be understood in their context. We don't have the right to take them out of the context and just make up a story with them. You can't just use them as a kind of a diving board and spring off it into some fantasy of your own. Not when you're doing Bible teaching and trying to understand the Bible, you can't anyway. So at that time, Jesus answered, at what time? We need to go back a bit. So let's go back just a little bit to verse 20. We should go back farther than this. There are at least four timestamps in this one chapter. You can trace them for yourself. But here's chapter uh, 11 and verse 20. Then Jesus then gives you a link to a previous timestamp. He began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. 
For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Tyre and Sidon were, were almost kind of the marketplace of the heathenish notions that kept on flooding into Israel. Um, the, the, other, the other gods and that came through Ahab, whose wife was a kind of a priest of religions who came from this Tyre and Sidon area. Um, and then he goes on to one of the other cities around the Lake of Galilee. Verse 23, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For, listen to this, brothers and sisters, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. What an amazing thing. Capernaum, he made his home. When it speaks in the Bible of a returning to his place, it means Capernaum. This is where he did most of his miracles. And he says to these cities of Galilee, which have seen most of his faithful witness to them and of his miracles and the things that he's taught, he, he, he rebukes them because they haven't repented. Elsewhere, he rebukes them because they didn't come and then because they didn't repent. Verse 24, I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. These, I think, are probably the strongest indictments that Jesus ever made to any people. This is devastating stuff. This really does sound as though it's um, it's all over. The thing is absolutely finished. There's no possibility uh, what's going to happen to you. It, it, it's, it's, it's all over. It would, it, it would have been better for you to have been alive in Sodom. And you know what Sodom was uh, kind of symbolic of in this particular constant. Weird, vicious, um, grotesque perversions of relationships. Um, and God destroyed it. And yet he says, it's going to be worse for you, Capernaum. And you think, well, this doesn't sound like the, the loving and gentle Jesus that we thought we knew. This is the faithful witness. Do you think he ne'er rebukes me? Oh, what a false friend he would be if he never, never told me of the sins or the faults which he must see. And then it goes on to say this. At that time, there's that verse 25 date stamp for you. At, that, at what time? At the same time as he'd given this terrible indictment to the cities of Galilee, at the same time, he says these extraordinary words. Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come! To these people that he's just given this ringing indictment to, that he is, apparently he is condemned to a fate worse than any of the traditional enemies of God's people, he now says, come. Isn't this extraordinary? That a God who can be so faithful in his love must rebuke our sin, must put his finger on what the problem is. He must do. But he never leaves it there. He always says, come. He says, repent. And then he says, come. The people of Israel neither repented nor came. He, he takes two people elsewhere to illustrate his points. He takes the people, Jonah, the people of Nineveh. And he says, the people of Nineveh repented when they heard G Jonah speak. And there's one greater here than Jonah. So if you want a definition of what the Bible need, means by repentance, you need to look at Jonah chapter 3 and see, because Jesus says the people of Nineveh repented. So if you want to see the implications of repentance, what it signifies, go to Jonah chapter 3. 
And then he says also elsewhere, um, he commends the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of the South, and he commends her because she came and the people of Israel haven't come. So there were two things. He said, repent, and they didn't. He said, come, and they didn't. And if you don't take either the invitation or the command, then what is left for you? Only your fact, your past then, will determine your future. But if you take a choice now to respond to what he's saying to you, it's not your past that determines your future. It's the present. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the accepted time. Now listen to what he says to the people that he has just rebuked so strongly. Verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I was looking at some... Um, I was looking at a catalogue of Christian texts and things that you could get for um, your church building or something like that. And uh, they'd, they were using different Bible verses and they'd put this verse up and it just simply said, Come to me, all you who labour, and I will give you rest. And it grieved me to my heart. Because that's only partially true. You need to go on to see the next part for that first part to be true. Listen to what he said. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This symbol of the yoke is used often in the Old Testament. It's used of heathen kings who brought Israel under their control. It means that they have made an unconditional surrender to the king. And from now on, they are the king's servants, just as an ox might be or a, or a slave might be. They have committed themselves to him. So they've not only come, they have surrendered. So here we have these wonderful, so well-known verses. And yet if we look at them carefully, we'll find that there is an amazing implication here. It is not sufficient to come. You must come and surrender. You must put your head under the yoke of the authority of Jesus Christ. You must come and yield to him. And he then goes on to say, and learn from me. And that word, learn, is a, a word that has a kind of a verb form, which is this form, which does mean to learn. And it has a kind of a noun form as well. And that's the word disciple. So it wouldn't be wrong to say this. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and become my disciple. Take up your cross and follow me. You see, salvation is very simple as long as you listen to what God is saying to us. You come and you surrender to him. You see, being a Christian isn't adding Christ to your God shelf. In some countries, they'll have a shelf with lots and lots of gods on it. And sometimes people from those countries think you can just add Jesus to the God shelf and you'll get all the blessings that go from him. They like as many gods as possible because whatever God is giving a blessing, they may get it. So by all means, add Jesus to the God shelf. Not you cannot add Jesus to the God shelf. You have to smash the God shelf. You have to turn away from all other dependencies and you come and you bring your life in submission to Jesus Christ. So you come, you surrender, you bend your knee and you become his, you become his chila. <laughs> uh, that's a word, it's a Hindu word for the kind of the Nepalis in the meeting this morning. And he becomes your guru. He becomes the one who directs your life. He's the one who tells you what to think and how to live and what to do. He becomes the one who takes responsibility for you. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, he is a faithful witness. 
And you say, now this is turning a little bit ominous. I thought Christianity was kind of a kiss on the cheek and Jesus putting his arm around me and everything. Going to be wonderful after that. Well, that's all part of it as well. But listen to what he goes on to say. Take my yoke upon you <clears throat> and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. And then he says this. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. John, one of the people who heard him say this later on in his letter, writes and he says his commandments aren't grievous. The yoke of Jesus is not hard work. He does insist that we surrender to him, but he doesn't insist that we carry the weight of carrying out all these instructions that he gives to us. Because grace is available. His grace is available to you. I think some of you may have heard me tell this story before. <clears throat> there was a lady named um, Laura Ingalls Wilder who wrote a series of books called Little House on the Prairie and lots of other books as well. And they're fascinating stories. I worked at one time with someone who was distantly related to her part of the family. Um, she also wrote an interesting book called The Farmer's Boy. And the farmer's boy is actually the story of the man who became Mr. Wilder. Uh, his name was, um, <laughs> I was just going to tell you, it begins with an O. It doesn't matter. Um, it, it's, um, it, th th this, this is the story about her husband, and it tells the story when he was a boy. And when he was a boy, he was on a farm, and they, it was a really kind of a stud farm where they bred horses, and particularly they bred uh, class horses that would be used in carriages for uh, people with a fair amount of money and they would train these horses and they would they would train them in pairs and then they would sell them as pairs and they would go to a, a wealthy family so it'd be really like having your own uh, sports car almost to your own design with all the additions already built in and they were lived in a part of America where they had terrible winters, where they could have kind of 10, 15, 20 feet of snow. And at those times, you, they had to kind of dig a channel through from the house to the stables so that they could get to their prime horses and kind of feed them and look after them. And then there was nothing much they could do but just sit by the fire and do chores that you couldn't do that you could do there and nowhere else so they were doing things like they were they were sewing socks um, for the men and they were um, kind of mending things that needed to mending hemming handkerchiefs and doing various things and splitting shingles for the roof all kind of jobs that you could do indoors because you couldn't get outdoor and he tells this story it i wish i could remember his name okay and um, it's not going to come <laughs> until this is finished. Then he'll come flooding. Um, and he, 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 this this boy is watching his father, and his father is sitting with a piece of wood on his knee, and his father has a piece of broken glass in his hand. And what his father is doing is his father is using the piece of broken glass to shave. Oh, I missed a bit of the story. Almanzo, that's the boy's name. Got it, Almanzo. Don't you see? I didn't forget. I just can't retrieve things in the way I used to. Almanzo. Uh, Al Almanzo um, is had wanted to have a horse. He wanted to train the horse. And his father said to him, no, these horses are too valuable. You can't have a horse to train. What I want to do, you can have a little calf. And I'll show you how to train a calf. So we gave him a calf. And here's the father sitting in the mid of winter sitting with a piece of wood on his knee and with a broken glass, and he is scraping the yoke that is going to be tailor-made for the little calf so that there won't be any uncomfortable bits in it, there won't be any spikes in it. It will be absolutely tailor-made so that this little calf will be able to be trained to do the job that it's intended for. It's a fascinating little story, isn't it? <laughs> I want to tell you, your yoke will be tailor-made as well. God isn't going to put you under a yoke that came off a peg out of a shop. He isn't working on a conveyor belt. You see, disciple is a one-to-one -one relationship. 
And the yoke, the pattern that he will choose for your life will be a one-to-one task as well. Uh, his, his, he is the tender, loving saviour, but he's also the faithful witness. When I was speaking at Aurora, I decided I would try to give um, a title for this. I don't always give kind of titles. And I decided I would call it, Is Another O for You. O oh, love that will not let me off. Maybe you know the other hymn, the one that says, O oh, love that will not let me go. That's true as well. But this is a love that will not let you off. You see, he wants you to be perfectly conformed to his image. Paul was the same. Paul wanted to bring every man to a place of completeness in Jesus Christ. Almost done is under. Not quite finished is unfinished. He's continuing the work. And he is prepared for you. A tailor-made yoke. I don't want to get kind of sentimental, but I just want to tell you that whatever your trials are, if you have surrendered to him, if you have been willing to put your neck under his yoke and surrender to him, he has a yoke for you that is easy. It will not be hard work for it. It will take your decision to surrender, but it will not be hard work because he is bearing the other side of the yoke. He's carrying the weight. But you must walk with him step by step. I can remember, again, kind of thinking about yokes, being in Zimbabwe and watching them kind of training um, oxen to pull a yoke. And um, I remember just watching, fascinated, listening to And the person who was explaining to me says, yes, yes, and you know, uh, an oxen, he says, is trained either to be the right-hand side or the left-hand side. He says, if you've got one that's been trained for the left-hand side, it can't do its job properly on the right-hand side. And vice versa. You see, everything is foreseen. He knows what your path will be. He knows what he's training you to do. Your yoke will not just be a standard one, such as Ten Commandments that fit every condition, irrespective. It will be his yoke, not Moses' yoke. His yoke. And he will give you the necessary grace to submit to it and to fulfill his purpose. And you will work in synergy, the two of you together, side by side, plowing the furrow that he has chosen for you. Isn't this a wonderful promise? I think I think he is just wonderful in the way he cares for us. But there is a love that will not let us off. So don't settle for something that's second best. Don't take your own path. Don't do things your own way. Don't, don't, whatever you do, try to see how much you can get away with. Surrender. Put your head under the yoke. Come to him. Not to a doctrinal statement. Not to something that other people have told you. Come to him. Put your head under his yoke. Learn from him. That yoke you will find is easy and that burden you'll find is light. I'm going to pray for us all together. Lord, we thank you for a love which passes understanding. We thank you for the mercy of God that endures forever that we've sung of this morning, Lord, that because you are faithful, you never run out of the resource of mercy and covenant faithfulness. And as part of that covenant, Lord, you will you will be to each one of us individually a faithful witness. And I want to pray for myself, Lord, and I want to pray for my brothers and sisters that you will find us faithful to submit, Lord, to your yoke, to your way, without compromise, without any of those things, just simply being what you want us to be. I pray, Lord, that if we are finding parts of the yoke at this time onerous, uncomfortable, not quite what we expected them to be, things pressing down, 
Lord, I pray that you will assure us that your yoke is easy and your burden is light and that there is grace in you for all that we need and that as we come and as we surrender, you will give us all the necessary grace for every step of this journey in ploughing this tilled field that you've chosen for our lives. Lord, bless us as we seek to obey you and do your work. Amen. I entitled that message, which I shared with the Early Christian Fellowship in Reading, United Kingdom, The Love That Will Not Let Me Off. It was the 31st of May, 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 lockdown, and was delivered by Zoom. If you like what you've heard and you'd like to share it with others, we would love you to share it with others. The only thing we ask is please do it in its entirety. That's to say, include the introduction at the beginning and this little farewell at the end. We'd like people who maybe appreciate what they're hearing here to come and find more of the same. Uh, so we'd like them to come to www.biblebase.com or to come and search us out in Bible Based Podcasts which you can find almost everywhere you, where you actually use your podcasts. Please do use them. Uh, spread the good news of a full salvation in Jesus Christ. Thank you. This is Ron Bailey.